Everybody stand to your feet because we have been waiting for all those as 40 and older and know what double touch is. So it's like when they turn in that rope and you gotta wait for that rope to hit the ground at the right spot before you can jump in. Everybody might not know what double touch is, but for those of us that do, this is the right time. The rope is getting ready to hit the ground. So I just want you guys to put your anointed hands together as we introduce the song. No reference of God. 
God. They do anything and call it holy. They bring anything into the church and think they can claim it as holy. Bring it in mess and drama. Try to do everything they can to kill the sacredness of the kingdom of God. And you know, when you focus a lot on that, God begins to show you those things. It can kind of do something to your mind. And it's God, I need a word. God, I need a word. God, I need a word. God, I need a word for the church in this season. What are you saying? Where are you working? How are we supposed to till the ground? What is it that we're working to? What is the name of the spirit of this season? Because he's coming in and he's just taking people out and left and right. There was a time, Apostle, we had time to cry and feel sad. We don't even have time to cry and feel sad. We've got to pick up that sword and keep right on moving to what God has called us to do. But tonight, we step on the devil's head.
apostleship. Apostleship is about gods and nations. Yeah. We come to take down the gods that stole the nations from Jesus Christ. So everybody's not going to like them because I'm not your little pretty Caucasian preacher. I'm not your little pretty mulatto preacher. I'm not your little pretty African American preacher. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ and I came to take back what the enemy has stolen from our king and from our kingdom. When I aim to hit, I hit. When I aim to punch, I punch. When I throw arrows, they land. Because when I get in the presence of the Almighty God, I go for what is my apostolic assignment for you to take care of in this earth. And when I'm in His will, everything works out for His plan and for His purpose. When I obey Him, Apostle, my bills get paid and no money won't even in the account. I've seen it over and I start to worry. And the Holy Spirit said, that's a distraction. Keep doing what I told you to do. I got something lined up. Angels are taking care of your bills. I need you on assignment. See, Apostle, y'all have a seat. Apostle, we've got to become who God has called us to be in this region called New England. We've got a lot of people that proclaim the apostleship, but have no clue what apostleship is all about. We're not the preachers that you happen to call just to preach a sermon. You want to hear from the Lord. You want to hear what God is saying in this season. No matter what the word might be, God speak to us for our next season. You see, I attend a lot of church anniversaries. And I like the long sheets of paper that they have telling us where they've been. And all the things they achieved. But I can't find one person to tell me where they're going. All I know is we had Mary so-and-so and the mother's born in 34. And in 1945, the mother's born increased by two people. By year 66, we had six ushers in the usher. They're still here serving right now. Ain't nobody increased. Nobody grew up in God. They still want milk in their bottle. Nobody's preaching the gospel. Nobody's slain any demons. All they do is holding up a seat, just ushering. You go around and you hear all the things that they have accomplished. And you ask them, okay, that was good. But where are y'all going? Come on. Come on. And you'll be surprised how many pastors look at me like, um, we're just going to keep digging where we've been digging at, where we put our axe at. God ain't there no more. God has moved forward. God has moved ahead. God is in foresight and foreknowledge. And God wants to bring rhema to the church. And we want to keep reminding them where they've been, what we've done, what we've accomplished. What good is us getting together if we're just going to keep going over the same stuff and we're not telling the people where God is telling us to shoot at in this season? Vision is important. And that's why he told us without a vision, people perish. The reason why the churches are shrinking is not because of the devil taking them out. The devil's only taking out, but we ain't building up. We have no vision for them. We have no place to put them. If they can't usher and they can't serve in a level capacity, we don't know what to do with them. God forbid if they come in and say they want to preach. We don't act like we need preachers in the kingdom. A time is coming and the time is now when God is looking for his people to be loose. We can't handle business the old way. We've got to raise up disciples. We've got to convert them to sons and daughters. And we've got to send them to do the work of the gospel that he's came. We've got to stop building these towers of Babel and calling them cathedrals. It's time for apostolic centers to apostolize some people. Get them to know the real resurrected Jesus Christ. Let them see him in visions. Let them see him in dreams so that that conviction will be on their life. Lord, here I am, send me. See, we always have that cry, but when it comes, we never want to answer. It's going to interfere with my job. Well, I don't know about y'all, but when he called me, he said, what job? I said, it's going to interfere. I'm a single mother at this time. I got saved and, you know, I'm, I don't have a man here to help me with my child. And he said, what child? I said, God, it's going to interfere with my family and the things that I want to do with my family. You church tell me to get my family saved. The Lord said, what family? I said, Lord, what do you mean by that? He said, if I take them all from you, you'll have nothing anyway. See, that's how he called me. I don't know what kind of calling y'all had. Sometimes I wonder if y'all even had a calling. Sometimes I wonder, I'm going to speak to the apostles, y'all. Sometimes I wonder if the phone ever rang and did you ever even pick up the call.
alcohol. Because he didn't call me to cushy ministry. He didn't call me to pick and choose what I could attend and what I wanted to go to. He said, your life is not your own. He said, you're no longer black or white. You're no longer male or female. I'm telling you to put all that down and follow me. He didn't say put all that down and they're going to come to church when things get right. And now, I don't know who teaches this. The whole family going to get saved. Who teaches that? We're in 2018. This ain't the pretty little church that everybody did on Sunday mornings because that was the thing to do back then. The enemy done destroyed families. The enemy done cut jobs in half, took hours, made minimum wages going all kind of different ways. And families, everybody in the family working. As soon as kids are teenagers, we got to do jobs. Everybody's working. Nobody's home. Nobody has time for church. The beginning right there of the Antichrist and his trickery yes. to get us so busy and so distracted that this becomes extra and this becomes work and this becomes too much and too many services and too much going on and there's just too much happening in the church. No, there's too much happening in your life. That's what you haven't cut out yet because when Jesus really calls you, he tells you to cast the net and follow me. You can't bring anything with you when you answer the call. The problem is we're trying to bring too many people with us. And I believe, I truly believe, not that everyone is an apostle, but we are all apostolic believers. We are all of the Christians after the apostles. We're all apostolic believers. So the call isn't going to be much different. He's calling us to come up out of our ways, come up out of our cultures, come up out of our lacks, come up out of our own mindset, and stop with this family church for Christ's sake. I read a scripture the other day, and I could picture it in my mind. Jesus had a big old conference. Probably got Jake's coming. Probably got one either Vino coming. Who the new one? Hannah, I think his name is. Probably got him coming. All these people coming in there. Big, big preachers coming. And Jesus is up at the front talking to the people who run in the conference. And they said to him, hey, Jesus, your family's outside. Y'all remember that text? Jesus looked at him. He was like, first of all, I know he rebuked him. You interrupted me for what? He said, your family outside. Jesus said, my family? My family is in here. And if they was my family, they would have been here already. They come in late, wanted front row seats at the conference, wanted to distract the service, disturb the anointing, recalibrate the praise and worship, because that's my family, so I can walk in grandiose whenever I want to. I can run praise and worship. I can get an attitude and make daddy change anything I want changed. I can act up and get people to get attitudes. I can let people know that when I want to get stinky, I can empty this church out with an attitude. Family church got to go. Family church is not of God. It wasn't ordained by God. They are family if they're in the church working with us. I'm sorry to have to tell you. We can't make all these allotments for people that's still in the harvest that God has given us. It's enough warfare going on in your families, the Jezebels in the church. Y'all don't see this, no way? It might not be y'all. Y'all might be a real working family. But a pastor going to double check the list twice now and make sure. I didn't my family. I didn't work in people. I bless the Lord for you, apostle, and everyone in their respective places in here tonight. I bless the Lord for my husband, all the elders, Pastor Dean, all the women, all the ministers, ministers in training. All of that's right around the circles, lost in the circles, find a church I can make room for them too. I bless the Lord. I bless the Lord for. Prophet Tanya and her wonderful husband. Praise the Lord. Wonderful great people to be here tonight. The wonderful ushers and hostess that greeted us. Bless you all. We came to truly celebrate these 31 years with you. And our prayer is the continued duration of the vision that God has given you in this place. This place had an anointing then, and this place got an anointing now. When I walk into the place, all I feel is I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the warfare that I was in today. That praise and worship made the demons flee. Warfare pushed back. They don't like praise. Hallelujah. When we look around our sanctuaries on some Sundays or some other services that we have, and 
Sometimes we see empty seats. It might appear that we don't have a lot to celebrate. But I just want to give you a couple pointers before I give you the prophetic word that the Lord has given me for the house of what we are to celebrate on tonight. One, if you are having these thoughts, I want to let you know how wrong you are. We have a lot to celebrate. First of all, we are blessed that we get to worship in a place where people love God. Yeah. Hallelujah. And you can tell the people of Wayfair, I see Triumph Ministries, Apostle and his executive pastor and his pastor and his old church with him over here. I see them in the house tonight. But we are in a place where we get to worship with people who love God. Yes. See, when y'all answer the call and you get ready to go out a little bit more, you're going to see not anybody love God. They make preaching hard. They sneer at you. They turn around. They be giggling and laughing in the scene. And you pleading the blood. You casting out demons. They running with their cell phone out to the lobby. They answer the phone. And they looking in while you preaching on the phone at the same time. Nonsense. I close my Bible up. And I put my iPad down. And I said, this stuff is going to stop. My security guard was in the hall. He's like, Apostle, this place is off the hall. Nobody had any order. The word of God could not set and do anything. Some of the men couldn't even string the instruments that they were 
ring. And, and I just felt such a heaviness from the prophetic dream that when I woke up, I said, God, why does it feel so depressing to me? I mean, it shows that the, the church has age to it. It shows that it has vitality. It shows that people are staying there and are sticking by their leaders. He said, no, that's an ancient old religion that they're in. That is not of me. When you walk into these places and I show you this oldness, the oldness shows you that religion has taken from them, which has therefore taken from me everything that the caterpillar, the canker worm, and the palmer worm has stolen from them. What I sent them was to teach them and to bring them up, not to destroy them. But instead of preaching what I'm doing and where I'm at, God said they're so busy preaching about what has happened before, what the first pastor did. I go to some of these churches apostle, and they're telling me about the pastor that was there before I was even born. I'm on the program. Microsoft has a vision statement for the next 300 years. What's your vision statement? Do you see yourself being around in 2019? What does that look like for you? What have you forecasted? The enemy is getting us on this, y'all. I know y'all might not like it, but I want to preserve a church in the name of Jesus Christ that you will last to be around here for another generation and another generation that when y'all are gone and resting in your beautiful vacation home down by the ocean somewhere, you get a tithe in the mail from Wayfair in Connecticut and Wayfair in Florida and Wayfair in Carolina that y'all can rest and live a good life because you serve your season through. to raise up leaders. Who cares if they preach better than you? I tell my church, you better preach better than me. How are you going to sit under this woman with this big mouth all these years that love the word of God and you can't preach? You can't break down a Bible? You can't tell me Jesus' arrival from the garden all the way through the New Testament? You been with who and you can't tell me that stuff? You ain't been with me. You ain't no more Christian than a piece of metal with an engine in the garage is a car. Because I love the word, apostle. And I can get in the word, and I can find myself 5.30 in the morning still in the word. All evening, starting like in the morning, all evening, all night. My husband getting up for work, and I have to fake sleep. I slide down. This is the alarm going off, and I'm still up. Eyes big, I'm all in the word. Revelation flowing, enlightenment coming. I can't turn it off. So he's tiptoeing around, don't even know I'm, I'm with my other man. <laughs> Woo! Jesus! <laughs> he don't mind that one. <laughs> you can't tell me you've been with me and you don't know the word. That told me for years the student is never greater than the teacher. So they told me from the beginning, I got my foot on your head. You're gonna go as high as I let you, and you're gonna preach as often as I want you to preach, and you're gonna prophesy under me. Because the prophet is ruled by the prophet of the house, or whatever that religious stuff they used to tell her. And I found out the real interpretation of a student never being greater than the teacher is that today I may be teaching you, Tanya, and you're not greater than I am as the teacher, but tomorrow I may sit in your financial class and you are the teacher. I am no longer the teacher. I sit as a student under your tutelage and glean from you what I can glean from you. That religious nonsense kept us stuck and it had me so stuck I was teaching it to our church. Wouldn't let anybody grow. Wouldn't let nobody go for it. Tell them what they told me. Oh, you can't preach. Who you think you are? Now I tell them, preach, baby, preach. We got 12 year olds preaching. We got 10 year olds preaching. We talk about the millennials. We already got Generation X, Generation Y. We got the Omega and the Alpha generation. Get a vision, y'all. These are the name of the millennials that are coming up in the next season. I have to beg these young women in our church. How old are they, Thomas? You passed it in. 23 to 30, 25. Okay, under 30 years of age. We had to beg them to get up on praise and worship. God of ways to sing. But too busy caught up with Ronnie, Bobby, and Mickey, and Mike. They wasn't willing to sacrifice what it was going to take to answer the call of God on their life. So I said, they need their own pastor. So I put her over them. I said, you're going to oversee them, and you're going to pastor them. And we think we're doing something. Because we got the millennials now. We don't just have 
team A. We got a team B now. All of a sudden, one rehearsal, a little seven-year-old goes to them and says, well, when do we get to sing? Sung so much, tell me if I'm lying, sung so much in praise and worship on Tuesday till she started prophesying in rehearsal. And she started saying how, God, we love you. God, you're the finisher of our soul. You're the maker of our soul. You were there. God, we need you. God, take over our soul. Teach us how to love you. And then she said, and God, some people don't love you. Broke down crying, shut rehearsal down. Everybody threw it over with. I thought I did something. Pull it up in the millennials. I found out we had the next generation already. Fullness. 
Y'all know we get weary and well doing. We want to we just get up sometime in form or fashion where the desire for him is even greater on us. Where I want to experience what the youth are experiencing. I want to feel Jesus like that all over again. I want to feel him in the morning. I want to feel him in the night. I want to feel him when I'm in warfare. I want to feel him when I'm in the mood. I want to feel him when I don't even want to do it anymore. I want to know him in the trueness that he is. The way these young people are experiencing him. So for all these witches that are praying against us, against apostles and pastors and taking them out last October, three pastors that I know in our region, heart attacks. Two of them, in order to recuperate from the heart attack, had to go down south to get up under this Jezebelic warfare. Because there's no joke up here. Honor your leader. The fact that we still stand in is nothing but God. We've got a lot to celebrate. The church is going to exist. And the church is going to last through the ages. It may not be everybody. But the church is going to last through the ages. So while we may be few in numbers on some Sundays or some extra services, we get to worship in a place where the word of God is. And we bless you again to celebrate that you bring the word in this place. See, writing a sermon is easy. Anybody can write a sermon. We watch commercials and get sermons. We drive down the street and see a billboard. We get a sermon. Writing a sermon ain't the problem. For leaders, you got to live that sermon out. That's the part that you've got to live out. Anybody can preach. You don't have to hire anybody and bring them in here to preach. And they will preach you up that wall and back down again. But are they living what they preach? You get to watch your leader to find out, is he living what he's giving you? Is he eating a balanced diet? So I'm blessed tonight to be surrounded by people who are living their faith out before God and the world around them. Today, we have to celebrate because God has been good to us, individually and as a church. Tonight, Wayfaring, this need to be a recommitting night for y'all. You need to recommit yourself back to him and recommit your promises and your vows back to him. You need to boldly come to this altar. Whatever I was afraid to give up before tonight, I'm going to give it up for the call of God that is on my life. Some of y'all been in the same warfare for so long and don't know it's that one thing that you refuse to stop doing. And you may not even call it a sin. God just don't want you doing it anymore. Y'all ever get those kind of things? Look it up in the whole Bible. Well, it ain't a sin. I can keep on doing it. Only to find out God has personal preferences. There's places the church can go he don't want me at. There's conversations people have he don't want me in. There's things people read he don't want me reading. There's personal preferences. And there's a thing that God is asking from y'all tonight to take this place to another level. I see this place not just expanding, not in size, expanding as in seeds. I see other ministries. And for you to have a peace with letting them go and form these ministries, have a peace with it. The only way you're going to get that peace is from God. But I see this thing bigger, and I see it broader, and I see it strengthening. I see headquarters. I see coming together for teaching. You love to teach. I see teaching of this leadership every year, having a, a conference of your pastors. I don't care if it's six or eight to start. You've got an anointed ministry. And it's hard for us to want to let people go. I know it. Sometimes when the Lord be reminding me, all right, now I got you on a deadline with so-and-so, I'm like, Lord, I don't even know if I can minister. Woo! And God says, I need you to let them go. Because this is a feather in your cap. Y'all know about that? That's too old-fashioned for y'all. When you got a brim, right, sir? You got that feather in your cap? That's a good thing. A brim without a feather, you ain't saying nothing. Absolutely. It's a feather in your cap. We God trust you to send out all the ministries. But see, the problem that has kept us so stifled and so stuck was a few things that I'm going to touch on tonight, and then we're going to be out of here. Is that okay? Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Joel 2 and 25. Joel 2 and 25. I 
had to change this apostle because the Lord, I've pretty much got my five sermons set for the month where I'm going out at. And uh, Brother Randall asked me, what, what do you wish the scripture tonight? I was like, oh, I don't even know what church I'm at right now. Let me go in here and look at the iPad and see what the Lord said to this house. Because I specifically pray before I go to a house. I don't go bringing old sermons. I don't go in there with an exhortation and call it preaching. It is hard for me to go out to preach, not to write a sermon, but to hear what God would have me say to that place. And I just wish we all would have that, that before we go out to preach, we seek the Lord. Even if it's 20 minutes, give us that megabyte of what God wants us to have, not that gigabyte of you. Joel 2 and 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the pommel worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Hallelujah. The Lord's word is already blessed. There are many tonight that have gone through and are going through but are still standing with Jesus through this new age. Y'all don't even know the delightment that I have inside of my heart right now to see each and every one of you. Because I know how hard it is in 2018 to remain a Christian. There's a lot of temptation. There's a lot of things going out there. You know, you got people that's turning down church service to stay home and watch Scandal and Empire. They don't want to be in church because of power. It's just so much stuff that's just tempting people so easily. Now, there's some folks even told me they stayed home for the voice. I'm like, hey, hey, do y'all see that this stuff is the stuff that is distracting you? And if these easy distractions can get you, the enemy's got you without even a fight. He said the very elect got to be careful that they make it in. You're not even considered an elect. You're taking out, you're just, you're just a tear. You're not even the wheat that's going to protect what God has set in this earth. We've got to get a mind that's converted to Jesus Christ. That no matter what comes, no matter what goes, I am in this thing to win it. I was prophesied years ago, eyes have to see. The words have ears heard, and I'm holding on to that. I'm holding on to the prophecy. So today I come to prophesy and declare a promise from the word of God. This is a promise tonight of restoration. He's going to restore. Because some of the people that left apostle were supposed to be under you and having ministries under you. Some of them have gone out and tried to start ministries. Some of them got out and just flat, couldn't do anything. Pride has kept them from coming back to you. And when the Lord showed me that in our ministry, I began to pray. And they began to turn and come back. Well, I realized that we have just gone through a season where prodigals were coming back home. It's where they belong. When they come back, your people have got to be prepped to receive them. Y'all can't beat them up. You can't judge them. You can't argue with them. You can't make them feel unwanted. You can't tell them you shouldn't have left. You got to say, welcome home. Yeah. That woman on the other night prophesied, Joe was coming. Here's my seat on the front row. We want you back here because this is destiny. And we realize that you may be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs when you left. But something got sober in you for a moment. And you heard Jesus enough to turn around and to come back home. Somebody got to give them a hand clap and a praise. Because if they belong here, we've got to want them here. Can't be with that apostle. I know you love everybody, but I'm just, um, I don't, to be honest with you, um, I don't really want them back here. One vision, no division. Sit down and be a disciple. Sit down and be converted to sons and daughters. And hopefully get ready to be dispatched to a nation. One vision. And it's a hard place when your leader has to hold down territory against the very people that say they got their back and telling them they ain't hearing from God. That vision didn't come from God. It's from God. And if we trust God to do what he has to do, how many of y'all believe you have cause of God on your life? I ain't going to ask you what. Just show me here. Be proud of it. How many of y'all believe that you're supposed to be doing full-time ministry? Very good. How are we going to do it if y'all keep making us lose everybody? We try to cut the rent check and the air condition check and then the heat bill about to start up again. We're in New England. How are we going to cut you a check if you only think the 12 of us need to make this thing happen? 
I will check for my people. And I tell them to their face, I'm bold about it. I said, you need to be paid, you need to be paid, you need to be paid, you need to be paid. We work hard. These folks in church all day long with me on the prayer line for free, in rehearsals for free, playing everywhere I go, even in the church. On, they need to be paid, Lord. I desire for your people that you put to honor shepherd with me to get a paycheck in the kingdom of God. And I'm not going to stop until I stop writing check. Because I got vision. And I know that the work we give to God will be so much better if we got them before they was tired from a day job. Tired coming in after a third shift job. Tired after they had to do it. Everything else. This is your job. Sing praise and worship. You get paid. Right. Did y'all not know that David's team were paid? The intercessors in David's kingdom were paid? Why the church got to keep operating with one person driving a Maybach and the rest of the people can't even keep their lights on? I don't have that desire. I want them. I told them, and after we do paychecks, I want us to get a house. And whenever y'all want a vacation, the keys is on the wall. Y'all log it out. The Davis has got it this weekend. Lisa got it this weekend. Joy got it the next weekend. Elder Tangy got it in April. We should have a house that we own so that our people can vacation and vacation well. I don't do stuff cheap. I want them taken care of nicely because we serve the Lord in experience and excellence. We don't wing what we do. I don't accept anything from them. The people that walk with me ain't no joke. If y'all can't tell about me by now, I don't take anything for the kingdom of God. If you can't bring excellence, go have two seats. Thank you, Jesus. Am I all right? Okay, sir. Yeah, he ain't mad at me. We stood through this new age. So today I got to prophesy what God has given me. I want to deal with the locusts. Are y'all ready? I want you to understand that the locust is not only something that is set for devastation and spiritual devastation, but the word locust comes from the root word rava, R-A-V-A-H, which literally means to multiply into multitude. So when the locust, he said, would come, he said that they will multiply into the multitude. It's spelled also in another form of our language as a change, resh, R-E-S-H, the word beth, and the word he, H-E-I. These letters and their order indicate that when a multitude of difficulties come upon us, it drowns out the still, small voice of God. See, when the, when the locusts came, some people couldn't stand through it. It drowned it out the voice of God. They couldn't hear the shepherd's voice. They couldn't hear the Lord's voice. So they started hearing other voices. They had voices coming into them telling them so-and-so don't like me. And you need to leave this church. Oh, they're about to move to another location. They must have spent all the money on apostle. And ain't no money in the church. Oh, this ain't consistent. Oh, this ain't. They started hearing voices. See, we have prophets in our church that tell us, apostle, when I come in, I can literally hear people talking about me. I said, is it people or is it the devil? Because people who hear other people talking is called bipolar. And there's a lot of medications on TV that you can take for that and sit back down and remain in church. Shut out the voices, get high on the Xanax, and get yourself together. Because you can't fight warfare. You just need to be high until you can get your warfare together and fight the devil. He told us to cast down every imagination. If this is bipolar, take your medicine. You better speak that truth. I can hear the people talking about me. What Satan just love that? Bipolar ain't even as bad as it used to be. Everybody got a little bit of bipolar in them. Since I started soul detox, I found out all the traumas in our life. Everybody got a little smidgen of bipolar in them. But if it's to the point where it's talking to you that loud, hey, it's on TV now, baby. It ain't no big deal. Go get your little dosage. Hook your little brain up. Get them chemicals lined up. Stop thinking it's a prophetic voice. You got some bipolar issues. Take your pills. Let's get a little counseling. Restore you back to who God has called you to be. You don't hear God saying, What are you going to do in your life?
life for the next year. You don't hear God saying who the next president going to be. You didn't even know God was putting this president in, but I ain't going to have y'all fight with me tonight. I knew. <laughs> Out on my face. And I came and told my church who was getting in the office. We got it recorded. It's on video. I told him the three things prophetically that he was in that office for, what he was going to do. And then somebody reminded me the other day, Apostle, you said that he was going to be about borders. And you was right. And you said it was Katrina. And you said to buy stock while we're under President Trump because he's going to bring a stock up. She said for the first time in her life, she got Nike stock. <laughs> Nobody said it was going to be Trump favorite people, but he made an economy for us to buy into it. We couldn't afford Nike a few years ago, but through the what? Through, through, through the warfare, Katrina went on and bought Nike. Go ahead, baby. Somebody bless God for her. That's what I'm working in the apostles' house. For their rabbinical teaching and learning, one of their ministry classes is the stock market. Before they can be rabbis, they have to learn the stock market. So they're in their little rooms all night long trading stock. And we're going to get blessed by tithes and offering. Bring your tithes into the house that there won't be room enough to bring their If the tithe is for the storehouse, how are you going to get rich? <laughs> you better go buy Nike while you can still afford it. <laughs> I'm telling you, to the point that the Holy Spirit even told me that pharaohs in the old days, there was three of them that I studied, that one of them wore a red hat. All of a sudden, this president get in, he got his red baseball cap in a little glass case sitting on the stage where he get, comes into presidency. I'm crying because I'm scared. Because he wouldn't have been my choice. But because of what God told me, I had to stand with him. Oh, y'all hate me if y'all want to. I'm going to tell you how you really know when God call you. When you got to stand for Pharaoh that you don't like. When you know things is wrong and out of order and God said, touch not. I put him there. And any time I put a Pharaoh in office, it's because I need to bring Israel back home. And the quicker we get it right, the quicker we could get from underneath this oppression. But instead, we on Facebook. Oh, the white man. Oh, the orange man. Oh, the White House man. Oh, the, the, the conservatives. Oh, the Republican. This ain't got nothing. I said it like that on purpose. This ain't got nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. This is a turning of the Antichrist. When you look and see, he has been the only president that has stood up for Christians, like it or not, Hillary Clinton and the rest of them want to bring an abortion. One of the first moves of the Antichrist is abortion. Yeah. Study y'all. Yeah. We can't pick by how they look anymore. The Antichrist said, I look like a light bearer. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So I'm asking the Lord, who's next? <sighs> I want to know who's next. And y'all should be asking who's next. You know why? Because the world wants answers. People are like, I got pastors that ask me, Apostle, which pastor, which um, candidate's getting in the White House? I told him, I told him why, and I told the three things that his office was about. Then people don't even bother talking to me no more. Done! <laughs> and then they even get on Facebook now and say, oh, um, yeah, I heard a while ago that um, somebody prophesied that it was going to be a pharaoh, and that's why God chose him. That doesn't make any scriptural sense. I said, unfollow. I ain't got time for your nonsense. There were so many people in the Bible days that missed Jesus. They didn't know it was him. They couldn't recognize him. And if I think everybody going to be with me, I'm crazy. going to lose my mind just like this. We've got to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is, what he's doing, and why he wants to do it. And when we can get on TV, when we can get on live stream, and tell New Haven, and Hamden, and Hartford who the next president is going to be. Why God is put Them folks going to come running in here. Because the church ain't had no news but old news for the last 200 years. Talk about it. Going on. We can't even tell who in the church that ain't supposed to be with us. Come on. We're a lighthouse. And we're supposed to be cutting edge. And then when you hear the, when you hear the, the um, what's the name of that thing? That they be reading when we go out. What is it? Huh? Church history? 
Church history, we only talk as though we ain't got no history. Okay? Church history, when you hear about the church history, you don't hear about apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. All you hear is mother's board, usher's board, the committee, the women that fight to serve communion. I mean, I, I, I don't want to go to church there either. Sorry, y'all. I have to confess, I am a real apostle, not by choice. I would have chosen to remain an usher. It was nice. It was peaceful. Once the evil folks pass you by, you're done for the rest of the night until they leave up out of the church again. I, I'd rather be back than we eat, we go, we share in meds, we got our feet up while the good preachers is preaching, and we don't stop work again until they punch up. I would have preferred to just stay an usher. But I don't boast in this thing. But the Lord said, while you're there, let me go on and use you. So that's what the locusts came. They came to draw out the small, still voice of your flock. Then the canker worm came. And the canker worm, the word is yalak, Y-A-L-A-K. And that actually means to lick or lap. And the Hebrew letters together in their order indicate a loss of hope. Some people left not because they didn't like you, not because they believe in you or your leadership. They lost personal hope. It couldn't happen soon enough. It wasn't happening fast enough for them. There's some in here still tonight. They're holding on by a thread. They're here, but their hope is gone. I meet a lot of people. I counsel 90% of my business is counseling. And I meet a lot of people who tell me their heart is broken. And I said, baby, there's no such thing as a broken heart. The Bible says when hope is deferred, the heart is sick. Your heart is just sick. We just gonna get you some happy medicine. We don't gonna get no bipolar medicine, but we just gonna get them some good counseling. We just gonna bring some truth back in their life and get their mind straight again to let them know hope ain't deferred. He didn't break your heart, cause you know even now you didn't even realize how ugly he was until you left him. <laughs> you, you, you forgot that he wasn't even what you asked God for. But because Ishmael come before Isaac, you just went ahead and settled for, for Ishmael. And then you wonder why the relationship didn't work out. That wasn't from God, baby. He, he gone and you just missed the memory of what it could have been. Your hope is deferred. Your heart is sick because your hope is deferred. You'll find another pookie to put it in. I promise you. I promise you. Let's get your heart here. You. Tell your neighbor, you ain't got a broken heart. Come on, tell him. You just lost hope. Let's get our hope back. Don't be afraid to talk to us. We need a word from each other tonight. Loss of hope is what the canker worm defined. But the Bible says in Psalms 118, 5 through 6, in my distress, I prayed to the Lord. Not pastor, not the prayer ministry. It was my, my distress, so I prayed to the Lord. And he answered me. Do y'all get that? I was the one with the distress. I'm the one that had to pray. And the Lord answered me. And he rescued me. He is for me. How can I be afraid? What can mere man do to me? Somebody say, God is for me. God is for now, Wayfair say, God, God is for Wayfair. Y'all shall live and not die. Yeah. Come on, let me give you that. Let me give you the count. Yeah. Hallelujah. I was so blessed. I'm not even going to cheat y'all out of that. I was so blessed to come in here tonight and see familiar faces. I said that when that brother reached and gave me that real hug, I said, that's what I'm talking about. I look over here, I scared a little bit more, I hit the musician department a little bit, looked around a few more rows. That's a blessing, sir. That's a blessing. Hallelujah. The caterpillar, y'all ready? The caterpillar in Hebrew is chasel, C-H-A-S-E-L. It means to devour. To devour. I'm not about to give you the three words, y'all follow me somewhere else, I might preach it again. The caterpillar devours you with fear. He comes to bring fear. Do you know how many people in the church suffer with fear? Been in the church all our life, we got all kind of fears playing in our mind. And we're trying to move y'all up and move you in and lay hands and anoint, and that fear just won't let you go. I'm telling you how to pray tonight and rebuke that caterpillar. Because it came to steal, kill, and destroy from your life. Exodus 23 and 22 says, But if you will indeed listen to me and obey my voice, I will be an enemy to your enemies. And an adversary to your adversary. Anybody got any enemies or adversaries that you need God to go against? What did he, what did he tell them? This is the last day you're going to see. 
them Egyptians. Yeah. Hallelujah. That person on your job, that's the last day you're going to see that Egyptian. Your in-law family, who got some people they married into? Oh, that's the last you're going to deal with that crazy man. God is going to be an adversary to your adversary and an enemy to your enemy. Tell that lady over the Tupperware committee in church, I'm about to be elevated. I ain't fighting you to get past the his Tupperware no more. I'm not fighting you for the communion gloves every Sunday. He's about to elevate me. <laughs> Pastor, I hate to bother you. I really hate to bother you. But, y'all know what bugged me, right? Everything preceding it is out the window. I hate to bother you, but so-and-so and so-and-so got to fight over the communion gloves. So-and-so forgot to order communion. I said, so what y'all gonna do? What you gonna do calling me? What you gonna do? Well, I guess we're gonna run out to morning glory. Obviously, y'all ain't got no morning glory. Y'all ain't got no communion. <laughs> what you gonna do? Church ain't got communion. I wish I could just have a seat next to you. Could you imagine? I said, what you gonna do? They didn't know what to do. I think they thought Jesus was going to come in that service and flip them tables over because we didn't have communion on first Sunday. Ooh, religion. So I said, let me just tell y'all this. I bet you if y'all don't serve communion, ain't nobody going to even notice. <laughs> we ain't had no communion on first Sunday. Now one person asked, what happened to communion today? So these folks don't know if they're coming or going. They done lost hope. They bond with fear. They got anxiety on their mind. They ain't thinking about no communion. As long as they can get a man or a woman to come lay some hands on them, they think everything's going to be all right. But Jesus said, I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversary. The point of apostleship is to point you towards Jesus, not toward us. Figure out what y'all going to do without communion, Elder Tangy. <laughs> The palmer worm, I'm almost done, y'all right? Say my. my. The palmer worm in Hebrew is gazem, G-A-Z-E-M, which means to cut off, to cut off. The palmer worm is pictured as filling you with grief and cutting you off from the joys of life. That's why they left apostle. They were fighting things, they didn't even know what they were. They were fighting things that they couldn't even describe to us. They were fighting things that they were so afraid to even discuss with anybody. So they bowed out of the fight gracefully. But God said tonight, the very things and the people included, that the caterpillar, the palmer worm, and the canker worm has come to distill and, and destroy from your life is being restored. He's going to do it without prayer. You don't even have to pray. This is prophetic inclination. It's going to happen without you even praying. You can leave here tonight. Don't even think about it. Just wait for them to walk in the door and just shake your head. God is a good God. Just get up and sing your own song. Take the mic from the praise team. Tell them there's a new share in town. You just get up and start singing. And when y'all see the apostle get up and start singing, y'all get up and start praising well. Because his prophecy is coming to town. Wayfaring is going up. Wayfaring, like you said, in prophetic order. The house is going to hit another dimension. The musicians are already ready to go there. verse is to restore you. The word restore is the word shalom. And I think most of us recognize the word, but it does have a wide range of usages other than shalom, other than peace. The word is used to describe peace, of course, completeness, healing, restoration, retribution, or repayment, among a few other things. Pastor, who owe you some money? Without telling me a name, you got a number? You do? $41,000. I decree and declare, come on, wait for I decree and declare that Apostle is going to get retribution of an amount no less than $41,000. Declares the Apostle of God under the motion and the apostolic oil that is upon my life. I loose it up in this place. Come on, give up an offering tonight. Lift up your prayer. Will restore the years that the insects have destroyed. Now, 
you know, if you want to just take me home after dinner with y'all, when you get it, I ain't going to ask for a sliver. Just, just take us out for a nice dinner, you know? I want to eat like Tanya eat. Tanya eat good steaks. That man got had three jobs, because that woman ordered the best. The word years is Shana, which literally means to repeat, to change, to disfigure, or to alter. It can also mean again and again. The word years that the insects have destroyed. The word years is Shana, S-H-A-N-A-H, which literally means to repeat, to change, to disfigure, or to alter. It can also mean again and again. And I prophesy to you tonight that everything that the caterpillar, the canker worm, and the palmer worm has tried to do to this ministry, your endurance has already been proven. Your end is already solidified. You fought a good fight, and you've also boxed like a boxer who was on his skill. Apostle Paul tells us we gotta know how to box. We can't act like somebody who's hitting the wind. God's gonna let you know you've never hit the wind, man of God. Even in the days that you felt like you said to your wife, honey, I think I've missed it. Baby, I don't think I hit it today. I just, I didn't, I don't feel that it was what the people wanted. Maybe I'm just not here and bringing them what they need in this season. God said you haven't hit the wind one time. Your stride has been perfected in him. You've been called and ordained by him. And for that, he's going to give you retribution. I prophesy to you tonight into Wayfaring Ministries, go up and go higher. Go up and go higher. Challenge and challenge some more. Because God is going to broaden this horizon. And he's going to take you outward. He's not going to build you up. It's not cathedral. God's not interested in it. A lot of those Catholic buildings are for sale right now are real cheap. He don't want us going up. He wants us going out. And when we got into Catholicism, that's when the church took its hit. That's when we started with all them guards walking around. How did Jesus and Peter and Paul and walk around all the places? with the KKK hat on and the long garb. That's not where Jesus is. That's not where he is. My bishop friends and them, they get mad at me when I talk it, but I'm gonna talk it even more. God is in the man. And just like when the president travels, wherever he puts his feet becomes the United States Oval Office, wherever you put your feet, sir, is the Oval Office of Apostleship. Walk here on. be mindful. Don't give it away. God said you gave too much away. He just dropped it in my spirit now. You gave too much away. Don't give it away. This one is for you. Where you want to live? Y'all staying in Connecticut forever? No? South? 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 Okay, we're going to leave. You don't want them to know yet. I don't blame you. Folks <laughs> right there. Our people are in there. You leave the pastor. We coming with you. Go your way. You better live across the border. Me and Pookie finally going to live our good life now. Okay, me and him gonna have a good time. 200 children. I bless the Lord for you, sir. I bless the Lord for everybody in this house tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Thank you, musicians. I leave a blessing in this house. In the book of Matthew, the word teaches that when apostles leave, if they're not received, they can take a blessing and not even leave a blessing. I leave a blessing on this house tonight, on the work on this house. Continue to do what God has called you to do. I love you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Who's taking the mic? Amen. Come on and put your hands together and give God some praise.